to cloud. Very good. And then we are going to share this other screen. I'm going to move that over here. Yeah. And hopefully you can all see that. Wonderful. Okay, so welcome to our April webinar. Um, as we're here, so uh, very excited to have everybody join us. We're going to continue trying to provide these monthly webinars to talk about what's going on, some issues, to share some ideas, and uh, want to tell you about one ones that are coming up. So if you want to mark your calendars, uh, Jen Brockwell, who partners with me on not only this, but also working on the Train to Trainer, uh, is herself. She's going to do the presentation on in May on interdepartmental assumptions, the bad apple effect. Uh, and it's really about when we should do cross training and how to do it, how to approach it, how to talk about it, and the value of it within insurance organizations of teams understanding what's going on in their other departments. So it's it's how to talk about that. I think it's going to be a great topic, um, and Jen will be leading that discussion. Uh, we have not settled on the June uh, webinar topic. We've had some great ideas sent in. Um, but I haven't nailed down a speaker yet, but you can mark down the date of Friday, June 14th. Um, and if, as it is for any part of the year, um, if you have an idea, a subject, or a topic that you want to hear about, or you're willing to be a speaker, I'm very excited about volunteer speakers, and uh, would be happy to talk to you about some ideas that you could share with the group, um, very much like Jim is doing today, of important things that we want to do as insurance trainers. So if you have any ideas, please send an email, reach out to me and to uh, to Jen, put it something in the chat. I will follow up with you if you communicate by any method, including carrier pigeon. So please do that. Uh, talk to you overall about what's going on with site. Um, we continue to try to bring you value as an organization, really unlimited benefits. I uh, want you to get more out of your membership in site. And, uh, you know, we have just kicked off the last train to trainer um, for the first one for this year um, in 2024, but there will be some other ones coming later in the year. So if you're interested in earning your ITP designation, going through the trainer, train, train the trainer class, please uh, let us know. We'll put you on a waiting list. We'll let you know when the next uh, opportunity is coming up. And then uh, we hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll have more information for you on when our annual conference is. So uh, more to come on all that. But let me, without further ado, let me turn it over to Jim. So I'm going to hit stop share. And that will give Jim permission to share his screen. All right. Let me find the buttons. I put my glasses on. And I know it's down here. And then Jim, you're going to have to. You know, let, are you okay with introducing yourself and telling us? Oh, a little sure, bit I can do that. Company in your group, yeah. And why we invited you today, other than you have a really cool beard, that you do. Yeah, let's see. Let me find my share screen. It should be at the bottom. I was Isn't thinking, all... yeah, there it is, big green button, big green right. button. And let me. No, oh, that's the one I'm going to share right there. Great. We can see that. All right. You can see that. Very good. Man, Jim, you got a lot of you got a lot of initials behind your name. I guess yeah, you well, I've been I've been doing this for 30 years now. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jim Cheney. Been involved with site pretty actively since I guess about 2012, 2013. And have done a lot of things in claim, mostly claims. And out of that 30 years, I guess I've got about 16 now full-time training positions. And so currently, I am a trainer for EA Renfro. And I do mostly training of new CAD adjusters. And that can be classroom, it can be online, or it can be uh, webinars, just whatever we need to do. So what we're going to talk about today is writing multiple choice test questions a subject that not a lot of people find exciting. I do. Uh, matter of fact, I, I got my start on this topic several years ago. The, uh, the ASD, which used to be ASTD, had a either a two or three day course. 
in person on writing test questions. And not many people want to go and spend two days in a classroom talking about writing test questions. So they haven't had that course in a while, but I picked up some really good stuff. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to start off. Whoops. Yeah, well, we'll talk about why we why would we want to do multiple choice. We're going to look at the other types of questions. We'll look at some basics, and these basics apply not just to multiple choice, but to the other things. And then for everybody that has to deal with the state of Texas continuing education test, we'll talk a little bit about application versus knowledge level. So now we'll start with our poll question number one. So see what everybody has to say about this one. Are you launching the polls there, Jim, or do I need to do that? Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing the polls. All right. Um, uh, Jen, it appears that uh, it your uh, my polling is inactive because you logged in as well. So can you launch that poll? <laughs> okay. I wonder if I can. I launch. love this. I hit launch. Oh, there we go. Whoops. That's number four. Oops. <laughs> oh, all right. Back, back, back. Oh, oh you gave the answers. I did. I? Maybe. Uh, oh. Only you can see that as a, maybe as a host. I, I don't see it. Maybe. Jen. maybe. All right. Hang I on. Saw it. Hang on. Oh. I'm going to end that one. I'm going to launch number one. How about that? There we go. That's the one I was looking for. What's your favorite type test question? And I know that's a loaded question. It depends on a lot of things. And still got people answering. I know that's a hard question because it depends on so many different things as to what, why, why do you mean favorite? It could be your favorite as far as how good they are at evaluating training. It could be easier to grade, could be a combination. And I think looks like everybody has answered. Most people prefer multiple choice. Although there's a fair good, a pretty good number of essay and fill in the blank. We'll talk about why you probably like those as, as we move on. All right. Next. We have the next polling question, which is similar. So let's do the next one. Are y'all seeing that? No. 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 Okay. I'm, it's not, not letting, letting me launch it. Launch. You might have to close poll number one before you can open up poll number two. Okay. Ah, I closed it. Okay. Stop sharing. All right. Launch. Oh, whoever said that is brilliant. There we go. So we know what your favorite is, but which one do you use the most? Yeah, I think we're gonna have a little bit different well, results I've here. This before, or <laughs> so you're just bumbling through this live on air. <laughs> I can't even see the polls. Most people have given their answer and it's overwhelmingly multiple choice. So we don't always use our favorite, do we? Yeah, and there's a whole lot of reasons for that. So let's get into looking at our different types of questions. Let me make sure 
my PowerPoint's going. So why do we use multiple choice? Well, first we have to look at why are we testing to begin with? One reason is keep attention. And of course, if you do polling questions that, you know, people have to do something, they have to interact. If our students know they're going to have a test at the end, it gives them incentive to pay attention. Doesn't mean that they will, but you know, maybe they will. Maybe they might even take some notes. Uh, it'll it, depending on how you do the testing. Sometimes that is a way to apply what they've learned. It's not just getting a score. It's seeing can they take what they 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 learn and apply it in some way. We may be able to evaluate what they learned, but to really do that, and especially to evaluate training, we have to do testing before, testing after, and look at the difference. And most of the time, we don't really do that. Uh, and it depends on how important it is to evaluate the change as opposed to who cares what they were before. Let's just make sure they're to a certain point by the end of the training. And then, of course, there's always licensing or certification tests. So our other options, if we're not going to use multiple choice, uh, we could do true, false, matching, fill in the blank, short answer, or essays, or even performance. So let's look at all of those, see what the good and the bad is. Then we might be able to figure out why we all use so much of the multiple choice. So true, false. It's quick to take, real easy to grade. It's either a two or an F. It's usually pretty objective. At least the grading is objective. It's, you know, there's no in between. But when we talk about how well it measures their learning, that's pretty low. Uh, the big thing is they've got a 50-50 chance of guessing. And... If you know some tricks, you can improve your odds. For instance, the words, either never or always. When you see those in a true-false question, what's the most likely answer? Yeah, most likely false. it's going to be false. Because when we write the true-false and we say you can never do this or you always do this, we're usually testing to see, do they know there's an exception to it? So, like this one. It is never legal for a driver to enter an intersection against a red light. Well, we know normally it's not. But, so, you know, someone may look at that and say, oh, well, that's true. But if you think about it, what about right turn on red? What about you're sitting in the intersection, you're the front car, and a fire truck pulls up behind you with lights and siren? Are you going to pull through the intersection even though the light's red? Well, let's hope you do. Let that fire truck through. So the word never usually means it's false. Now, we can, we can write questions where that would be true, but most of the time, if you see always or never, it's probably false. If we see usually, typically, sometimes, then it's usually true without knowing anything about it. And even if we don't know that, we still got that 50-50 chance of guessing. So it's not a really good type of question. Sometimes there's just some things that they just lend themselves more to true-false. Now, one problem with true-false, if you're dealing with continuing education, uh, the last time I, it's been about three years since I was involved with the online stuff with Texas, but they require testing and they also prohibit true-false questions as part of the testing. It has to be multiple choice. So it may be that you can't even use a true-false depending on what you're, why you're writing the test questions. So could we turn that one into a multiple choice? And yeah, we'll see later. Give you something to look forward to. All right, matching. Again, it's easy to grade. It is objective. 
and just like our true false, our quality of measurement fairly low because you've got that process of elimination. Because most of the time when we have matching, there's one or two. Oh, I know that one. I know that one. I know that one. And before down for long, you're down to just guessing a 50 50. And sometimes that matching, depending on how we set it up, instead of just one point, it's worth four or five points because each item gets matched. So it's a little bit easier to score points on the matching than just a plain multiple choice. Again, there are certain things that are good with matching. Uh, it just depends on where we're going. A little bit better than true false. Then we get to fill in the blank. Well, sometimes they're easy. You would think fill in the blank, that's easy to grade. I want them to put a particular answer, but are you going to count off for spelling? What about capitalization? Is there only one correct answer? Or if you're doing names, do you want the first and last name? Do you want first name only, last name only? What if they have some type of title? Do we have to put the title in there? They're, they're, if it's a military, do we need to put the rank? So being easy to grade depends on whether you're grading it by just one person looking at it or you having the computer grade it. Because the thing about computers, they're going to do exactly what you tell them, not exactly what you want them to do. You need, everybody's got that experience. But overall, they are objective as long as we, we make sure the grading is right. And they're better measure than true, false, matching, multiple choice, because they have to come up with that answer somewhere. It's not already on the page. So it really does a good job of minimizing their ability to guess. But talking about the, the, the grading. So we have this test question. Blank was the commanding general of the Army of Potomac during a particular battle during the Civil War? Well, the correct answer is Major General George Brenton McClellan. So obviously, if someone types that in exactly, the computer is going to say, all right, you got the right answer. But what about these other answers? What if we just abbreviate the rank? And instead of his middle name, we use the middle initial. Or what if we just use the word general? Or what if we say, well, the question already said he was a general. Why don't we just put his name in? Or if we know that the Union only had one General McClellan, it's just the last name okay. So you can see if I'm grading it by hand. And it's, in my mind, I'll take any of those. That's easy. But if we're having the computer grade it, and the computer also, what about the, the periods after the abbreviations or after the initial? Is that going to change the computer saying it's a good answer or it's not? And if that wasn't bad enough, what about all the different ways to spell McClellan? Now, that general spelled his a particular way. But there are lots of different ways to spell that last name. So that can also be an issue. Well, how close do they need to be to the correct spelling? Well, if we ask a different question, same battle. Commanding General of the Army of North Virginia. Well, Robert E. Lee is our answer. Well, that one, pretty much everybody knows him as General Robert E. Lee. And there is no Lieutenant General, Major General. It's just General. So that one, we can probably expect people to get a little bit closer. Hopefully, anyone taking this test will know how to spell Lee. I don't know of too many different variations there. But you, even with an answer that simple, you have to decide what you're going to accept as an acceptable answer. You have to make sure your students know exactly what you expect 
in these answers. So fill in the blank is good, but you have to think about grading, especially if the computer is grading it. Or we could just ask the question, what's wrong with that? And this one, if you know the answer, write it down on a piece of paper. This is not a polling question yet. We are later going to do a polling question with multiple choice. And that will make this one a little easier. So what character made his 1928 public debut in Steamboat Willie? Some of you are going to know the answer to this one, but hold it for now. Don't give it away. All right. So then we get back to our short answer and essay. Again, if it's more than just fill in the blank, it gets a little bit more difficult to grade. And it takes time. The grading can be subjective, depending on what kind of standards you set up ahead of time. You're looking for content. How are you going to count off for spelling? Are you going to count off for grammar? Are you looking for keywords where the answer has to have those specific words? Or are you just looking for concepts? And are you going to give partial credit? That Sometimes that's an issue with essay questions. Yeah, you got it almost, but you didn't quite. So how, how much quality you have in measurement, that depends a lot on how you're going to grade it. And of course, uh, you don't see these as much as you used to. I remember the old CPCUs where you got the, the blue book and you had three hours to write answers. And then handwriting was an issue. And I, 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 I would guess that most things are done by computers. At least the handwriting's not an issue anymore. And then we've got just telling someone, do it. And I'll see if you're doing it right. Well, that depends on how practical it is. Uh, and how easy it is to grade depends on what you're watching. I've got a class coming up where we're going to climb ladders and get on roofs. Well, that one's easy to grade. Did you safely climb the ladder, get on the roof, get off the roof onto the ladder and get back down? Well, that one's easy to grade. They either did it or they didn't. If they fall off halfway up, maybe there's a problem there. Maybe they don't need to be doing this particular type of job. Uh, how objective it is, uh, again, depends on what type of performance we're looking at. And are we looking at it as a pass-fail, or are we looking at how well they did it? Uh, as far as quality of measurement, that's really the best. If we're trying to teach somebody how to do something, well, watching them do it is the, the best way to test it. But it may not be practical. If we're teaching people how to fight house fires, we can't necessarily set a house on fire every time we need to test them. Uh, maybe we need to find other things. So that's our options other than multiple choice. So now we get to multiple choice. Probably the reason we use it more than the other types, even though it may not be our favorite, is it is easy to grade. It's objective, and our quality of measurement is kind of a medium. It's better than true-false or better than matching as far as the guessing, but they can still guess. They can still narrow it down. There's usually not those key words that will tell them, hey, this, this is the, the particular answer. So let's now do poll question number three, and we'll see about that character and Steamboat Willie. Did I make this one too easy? Ah, uh, all right. What well, looks like almost everybody said Mickey Mouse. We had one Willie Nelson in there. 
And let's take a look and see what the actual answer was. Get my. The answer was Mickey Mouse. And. All right. So we can stop that and look at the fact. Let's look at the other answers. Well, Donald Duck, he didn't come around until 1934. His first movie was The Wise Little Hen. Willie Nelson wasn't born until 1933. He's almost old enough, but not quite. And then, of course, Willy Wonka. He was a character, first appeared as a character in a 1964 novel. So that one, if you limit the two Willies were there just because there's a Willie in the title of the of the uh, cartoon. So I threw those in there just to see. But if you know something about their age and when they first appeared, then it was just a matter of guessing. Is it Donald Duck or Mickey Mouse? All right. Now, there is a way to eliminate the advantage for guessing, and that's to build in a penalty for wrong answers. And if you've ever taken one of these, they can be a little nerve wracking. Uh, the actuarial exams at one point in time were this way. I don't know if they still are. It's been a long time. But they would give you a point for a correct answer, but they would subtract a third or a fourth of a point if you did a wrong answer. Now, if you left it blank, you got zero. So you can offset that 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 uh, advantage of guessing. So if they narrow it down to one or two, it might be good to guess. But again, that takes some programming skill and goes down to the way you're grading. All right, now, finally, we get around to actually writing the test questions. Well, all of our methods, doesn't matter how we're doing it, uh, what type of question, We'll talk about how it relates to our objectives, and then we'll talk about actually designing the question itself. So planning this out, we want to start with our learning objectives. And every question should be based on a learning objective. Now, you think, well, that's obvious. But how many times when we're writing questions do we just pull up the PowerPoint and we go through the PowerPoint and say, well, okay, I'll write a question on this, a question of this, or we look at our training. We're not looking at the objectives. We're looking at the training and testing on that. It's better to write your test questions based on your objectives. Maybe somebody different writes the test questions and wrote the training. Then you can go back and make sure that your training covers everything that you're testing because you're really testing to see, did you meet those, those learning objectives? And then we have our SMEs, our subject matter experts. Dealing with our SMEs, you know, have a plan, decide who's gonna do what, have some time deadlines. You can try training your SMEs on writing test questions. Uh, I've had mixed results with that. Uh, a lot of your SMEs, they know they're experts. So they believe they are experts in writing test questions. So, you know, they, they have to be receptive to learning before you can teach an SME anything. And depending on who your SME is, I dealt a lot with engineers in past years. And they had taken lots of tests themselves. So they considered themselves experts on writing test questions. So another thing about SMEs is don't expect them to meet your deadlines uh, without some encouragement. And encouragement is really constantly communicating, bugging the SME saying, all right, where are you with this? Don't ask them if they're on track because in their mind, they're always on track. You know, ask them, do you have this done yet? And plan for delays. And again, understand their expertise, no matter what they think, their expertise is not writing test questions. So you may have to go back after the SMEs have written the test questions 
and maybe reword them. Maybe you need to even not only reword the question, but give it different, different answers. And then you need to go back to the SME and have them look at what you've changed to make sure you didn't write a test question. Somehow something you changed changed the whole meaning of it. And so I've done a lot of back and forth with engineers on test questions. I'll reword it. And then they'll say, well, no, that opens up the door to this and that doesn't make it a good question. So sometimes you're going back and forth. So back to our writing the multiple choice test question. We have three parts. And we have the STEM, which is the basic question. Then we've got our distractors, which are our wrong answers. And then, of course, we need to have a correct answer. At least we hope we do. So writing that STEM, that's where we actually ask the question. It's best to limit the question just to a single point. And if you can, and I know multiple choice can have fill in the blanks. I prefer not to. If I can just ask a question and then the person answering that should be able to just give me an answer. Like on the Steamboat, Steamboat Willie question. The first way I did that is I just said, okay, who is it? I didn't give you any options. That's what I want my multiple choice test questions to be like if I can. So when they read the question, they already know what the answer is. They don't have to look at the options. Sometimes we can't do that. But to me, that is the ideal multiple choice test question is where they don't have to look at the answers if they really know it. Now, that can either be knowledge level or application level, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Things that I like to avoid. Uh, I don't really like blanks in a multiple choice, but if I'm going to use them, I think they're better either at the very first, like we had on the question about the generals during the Civil War. I started off with that blank at the very first, or put it at the very end. And the end seems to be even better. I, I really, really hate double negatives where you use the word not in the question and then it appears again in some of the answers. That gets really confusing. There's also the all the above answers. And I don't, I don't care for those because if all of the above is one, I've got three, three distractors or three other answers. If I can figure out that two of those are true, then I know it has to be all of the above has to be the right answer. So it's a little easier to guess. You'll also find that states like Texas, when you're writing your multiple choice questions for online courses, they don't allow either all the above or none of the above to even be one of the answers. So again, that kind of rules that all the above. And try to avoid meaningless trivia. If you're just looking for a question to ask because you need 25 questions. Sometimes we have a tendency to kind of split hairs. And it depends on what level we're trying to test at. You know, if I'm teaching a freshman history class that every freshman has to take, then maybe those Civil War questions are a little bit more broad. Instead, if I'm teaching a graduate level history class, maybe what kind of general McClellan was makes a difference. So what makes it tr meaningless trivia? Trivia is okay. It's just how much meaning does it have? And then go and again, going back to our learning objectives, are we writing that just to make a certain number of questions? Or is that relate to our, our learning objectives? So that just keep tying everything back there. Always be sure the student understands the question. 
without seeing the answers. And what's hard is can, can the question be interpreted to mean something else? Because when you write the question, you have the whole thing in your mind. I want to test on this. But think about it. If someone else reads that, or can they twist it once they get it wrong? Can they twist it to make it mean something else so that their answer is right? Because I guarantee you they're going to try that. When they get that test back and they see that, oh, you, they got that one wrong, they're going to do everything they can to look at that and say, but if you read it this way, then my answer is correct. And that it's really hard sometimes because we, we have that learning objective where we're wanting to test about and we write our test question. Maybe have someone else read it. Maybe have someone who knows the subject matter very well and should have no trouble answering those test questions. Have them go through the questions and answer them and see if they come up with the same answer you did. If not, maybe there's a problem in the way you worded it. And you're not going to see that unless someone else looks at it sometimes. So now, your distractors. They should always have a very high potential for being the right answer. I know a lot of people like putting a funny answer in for one of the distractors. Humor has its place, probably not the best on a test, because guess what? If it's a funny answer, they know that's not the right one. So you just made it easier for them to guess, but it's more fun to take the test. And finding the three distractors that you need or four, however many options you're giving, a lot of times that's harder than you think, because obviously you have a right answer in mind. That one's easy. And I can't tell you how many times the first two distractors, okay, I got two, I have two wrong answers. That's easy. But what about that third one? Because I want to make sure that that all three have potential. I want to make sure that you have to know the right answer and that you won't pick one of those three, even though they're similar. So that can be the really hard part. And there have been times where I just had to think of another question because I couldn't think of three different things that were that had the, the right potential. And then your correct answer, obviously, we sh there should only be one correct answer. Uh, what about the order of your answers? You know, the options that you put down. If I have numbers, I like putting them in numerical order, either low to high, high to low. That way, the order that they're in doesn't give a clue to the, the test taker which one is the right answer. Same thing for dates. I like putting dates in order. Or maybe you, you do your answers alphabetical. There's a tendency, or at least I have a tendency, if I'm not careful what I'm doing, I have a tendency to not put the right answer as either the first or the last. I have a tendency to put it in the middle. Well, if someone figures out what I'm doing, that makes it easier for them to guess. So if you are just randomly putting it in there, make a conscious effort to put it sometimes first, sometimes last, sometimes in the middle, so that there's, you're not developing a pattern that someone can figure out. All right, let's do poll question number four. Which of the following was the first cartoon created with Mickey Mouse? That sounds a lot like the other one we already answered, doesn't it? <laughs> Are some of you hesitating because you think it's a trick question? 
All right. Well, let's end the polling and see what the right answer is. Because everybody answered Steamboat Willie. All right. And the correct answer is Wayne Crazy. Everybody got it wrong. And you're thinking, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, let's look at the two questions. The first one was, what character made his 1928 public debut in Steamboat Willie? Well, we know that's Mickey Mouse. And then I asked, which of the following was the first cartoon created with Mickey Mouse? It sounds like the same question, doesn't it? So it should have the same answer. All right, the first one, I use the term public debut. The second one, I said worse, the first cartoon created with Mickey Mouse. What happened was, Plain Crazy was created first, but Steamboat Willie was released to the public first. So it's two different things. So if I just asked what was Mickey Mouse's first cartoon, it could be one of the two. So you have to be careful how you word the question. You have to be careful what else they might know that changes it. So that one was really tricky. And of course, if they had released them in the order they created them, it really would have been easy. So let's talk about taking a true false question and making it multiple choice. Because well, let's say we really like that red light question, but we're writing it for Texas CE and we're not allowed to use true false. So it was, it is never legal for a driver to enter an intersection against a red light, true or false. Well, we could do this. It is blank. Legal for a driver to enter an intersection against a red light. Never, sometimes, usually, or always. Okay. Well, that, you know, it's harder to guess that than it is a true false. But if we kind of know the trick about never and always, that we say, okay, it's, I know it, I know always is wrong because, you know, I, we obviously aren't supposed to always run the red light. And I know that never probably makes it not tr true. So now we have to split the difference between what is sometimes and what is usually. Mm. It might be some argument over which of those it really is. What if instead we did something like this? We just ask a question, which I like better than a fill in the blank anyway. When is it legal for a driver to enter an intersection against a red light? We can still use the never and always, but then we can say turning right after stop if there's no traffic, going straight after stop if there is no traffic maybe a little bit better so if you can't use a true false and, and again i don't like the never and always but it's pretty easy to turn a true false into a multiple choice if you think about it and usually like i said those those true false a lot of times we're looking for exceptions to the rule so Write an exception and write something that might sound like an exception, but it really isn't. And now our last topic, application versus knowledge level. So with, with Texas and your continuing ed, if I remember correctly, uh, your, your, your online courses have to have tests and they have to be 70% application level. Well, that means it's not just something they know. It's something they have to take what they know and use it. 
And the why is simply because Texas requires it. And that's always been a problem for me because in my thoughts, online training is best for knowledge level training. So if it's best for knowledge level training, why do we have to have all these application level questions? It's not for me to say, right? We have to do what the states require. So how, how do we figure out how to do this? Well, one is if you can create a scenario, <coughs> describe a situation and keep in mind that whoever's reading your test questions, they probably don't know a lot about your subject matter. So when you describe a situation that's more likely to be a, to get it through as an application level, then if you just ask a simple question. If you're doing policy training, ask a coverage question. Here's the scenario. And then ask four questions about coverage. You know, what are you going to pay? You know, it's if any of you have ever taken the, uh, oh, what are they called? Uh, AEI test, the legal principles questions. They have some of the hardest multiple choice I've seen. And what they do is they give you a coverage scenario and say it's covered because, or it's covered because, or it's not covered because, or it's not because, because of something else. And usually you know whether it's covered or not, but neither one of those answers is exactly what you would put. So they, they make it kind of difficult. If you can somehow make it into a math problem, that's obviously an application level. And sometimes you've got a knowledge level question, but you need to turn it into application. Again, if you can find some way to make it a calculation, or sometimes if you can ask a question about a photo and they have to take something they, they've never seen that particular photo, but maybe they've seen one similar, and you're asking why something is about that photo. Sometimes you can get those through as application level. And of course, does it matter who looks at your the questions you've written to decide did, the ones that you mark as application level? Does who's looking at that make a difference as to whether they agree with you? Yeah, unfortunately, probably so. That That's a pretty subjective grade unless you can get into things like math calculations or coverage decisions, those are pretty clear. But what about, what if you've got a topic and it's just plain knowledge level stuff you expect them to know? For instance, uh, Texas Insurance Code, how long after receipt of a claim does an insurer have to commence the investigation of the claim? Well, that's about as knowledge level as you can get. Yes, I know that the statute says 15 days. But I need that to be an application level question. All right, look at this. According to the Texas Insurance Code, if a claim is received on Monday, April 2nd, what's the last day the insurance Ah, that should have been the, the insurance company, may begin the investigation of the claim and still be in compliance with the statute. You see what I did there? I made you, I made them figure out that that was Tuesday, April 16th. They still had to know the knowledge, but I turned that knowledge level question into an application by making them do something with the information that they had to know. And so if you're testing over Texas Insurance Code, fair claims practices, there's a whole lot of really basic knowledge level stuff, but most of that you can turn into an application level by making a calculation. Do something like that. And that may be the only way you get your test approved is to do some 
some manipulation like that. So just wrapping things up, uh, some good books on writing test questions. And uh, I got these when I went to that class a uh, long time ago. And we spent two days talking about writing test questions. And this was some of the reference sources they gave. And they these are some really good books. So any questions, comments? We still got some time left. And I haven't been watching the chat. I guess I should be. Oh, there's a lots of chat in there. I am so sorry. Well, there's a lot of commentary, um, really asking about those who had used AI to write draft test questions. Uh, some people felt that maybe the learning objectives were someplace they might have to write a lot and could use some additional help with structure. Um, have you used AI for, for questions or did you feel like I, 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 I've never got that? Uh, I'm kind of old school. Mm -hmm. I, I, I still write them by hand, then type them up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, but AI may be where we're going with that. Uh, I use AI know. extensively. And what I found with AI, you've got to work with it because it's just like anything else. The quality of the prompts dictates the quality of your questions. So you have to learn to work with it a little bit. Uh, I use it all, all the time. Uh, it's not perfect, but it does take a lot of the heavy lifting out of the equation. Because mm -hmm. you can manipulate them after you have the questions generated. Right. Good way to get a starting point, and then you just find. Right. Yeah, I've I've never tried using that. I've uh, never had access to it, so that's something that uh, I know we're going to be using AI for a whole lot of things we never imagined before. For content. Mm hmm. So there were a couple comments, certainly of funny questions. People have been asked on different types of exams, uh, like an umbrella policy was more like a umbrella bumper shoot. And, uh, and then there was folks struggling with distractors, how to come up with that as a valid distractor from the actual answer. Yeah, uh, those can get, I, I can't tell you how much time I have spent trying to write questions, just looking for that last distractor. The first two were easy. Mm -hmm. That third one, you're going through your material and saying, what can I throw in there that somebody, because it needs to be something that somebody might pick as a choice, either because it sounds like the right answer or because it's a term that was used in the training, but it means something else. It's not the answer to this question. You know, and that's where AI can help. I, I've actually put in prompts, make your distractors, you know, such and such and such as, and it, the more you work with it and it gets used to your style, the better you're going to get uh, quality material. You've got to work with it. You're, somebody was right. When you just first start it, it's very casual. Uh, I found numerous errors because I wasn't specific enough. Mm -hmm. but it's just like anything, just like any tool. The more you use it, the better you get with it, the better, out, the better results you get. Mm hmm yeah, I mean, computers are doing so much more now than they they did even four or five years ago that uh, uh, can really help. It's just a matter of learning how to use that tool. Mm -hmm. And then, Jim, there was a couple comments about really just making a conscious effort to get rid of those double negatives, triple negatives, even on some old licensing exams. Of just mm -hmm. Those are just mean. I mean, I, I really... I mean, and they're just, they're so confusing. Uh I, I don't really, you know, sometimes I ha it's best to have not or no in the, the question. Mm -hmm. uh, on those, if I use the word not, a lot of times I'll capitalize it to make sure they see it. Mm -hmm. uh, if I know I have some of those in my exam, when I first hand out the exam, I tell people, watch for the word not, because it changes the question. Don't, don't rush through this. Yep. But then, if I've got not in the in the question, I I don't want no or never or anything like that in in one of my answers. It it just makes it so confusing. Yeah. 
and there was a couple comments. Just remembering back to the, I think you may have even made a comment about the old CPCU exam with the three, the three hour short answer. Mm -hmm. and, you know, really the feeling that is scary for people to have to fill out and worry about their penmanship and the way they write. And, you know, these mul good, good, well-written multiple choice questions, you can still test people on the knowledge without causing that fear of, you know, it, it, especially if it's not something they use for their job of of being able to write these short answers it's it's not necessarily these can be better tools and we can get more people through the education and do it more efficiently certainly the grading than trying to do short answers <laughs> yeah and but it just depends on what degree of expertise you want them to have mm -hmm. uh, sometimes just recognizing the right answer you know, especially when you're doing, uh, if you're trying to test it, they understand how to do a coverage analysis. Mm -hmm. And I want to see how they're thinking, not just are they coming up with the right answer, but I want to know how they got there. Yep. Well, you can't really do that unless you do the short answer. So, or essay type. So just depends because it's been a long time since I used those uh, because when you do that, and of course, we were using handwritten. So after class, it was take everybody's test home and spend the the evening grading tests so I could give them back tomorrow and uh, evaluate. So it, it does take a lot of time. Of course, if we're doing them online or on computer, at least the typing eliminates the uh, uh, the handwriting issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and depending on the, the program. It might even also help them a little bit with their grammar and spelling. So uh, that could help a little bit. It'd be a whole lot easier to to read and evaluate a typed paragraph as opposed to the handwritten. Uh, well, thank you, Jim, for joining us. Thank you for sticking around for some additional conversation. I, I agree this is an important topic, a key topic of, and a practical one that we can all use going forward. So really appreciate the conversation uh, and please join us next month in May for our own Jim Brockwell. And she's going to talk to us about the bad apple effect. So uh, right. thank you for joining today and I uh, hope you have an awesome Friday. <laughs> See everybody later. <laughs>